was your fault. Fix it. That was your fault. Not you. Okay, we're live. Oh no! Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. All right. All right. Wow. Whoever is listening to this, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Rebecca Chambers, and I am uh, the facilitator here uh, with uh, through Rise Academy, and I am joined here with three of our social change makers. Um, and in our program, we work virtually with youth from around the world. So we have two young men from uh, the UK. Uh, do you guys want to say hi? Hi. All right. And we'll find out more about you too. And we've got another one from Ottawa, which is where I am. Do you want to say hi, Josh? Okay. You got to be nice and loud. Hello. Uh, Awesome. So we work with youth from around the world between the ages of seven and nine and 10 to 14. We offer a program called the Social Change Makers Program. Uh, we learn about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The youth find issues that they are passionate about and they learn how to use their strengths and superpowers to give back to their community and the world. We are also going to be joined uh, with another amazing uh, young, or he's not so young anymore, a former student of mine, uh, Kyle Elliott. Uh, so we're very excited to have Kyle with us. He's not here quite yet. He's a very busy lawyer. Uh, so he's going to be popping in uh, when he is able. So uh, before we get started, just a few things we wanna go through. I'd love to introduce uh, everybody. So Noah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where, how old are you? Where are you in the world? So as you know, my name is Noah. I'm 11 years old. I'm in Bath um, in the UK. And that's all to say. Thanks. Awesome. We're so happy you're here. All right, Nathaniel, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Nathaniel. I am in the UK, Bristol, and I am 13. Wonderful. And Josh, how about you? Hello, my name is Josh. I live in Ottawa, in Canada, and I'm 12. Wonderful. And we are very excited to have uh, also with us today, and hopefully he'll uh, jump into some of the conversation, uh, James Delaney. Uh, who we met through Noah and his first project, uh, who he is uh, really involved in an organization called Block by Block, uh, which is an amazing organization that uses Minecraft uh, to do some really, really cool things. So you need to, to check that out. Maybe we can hear James talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so right now you can see, if you're watching us live, uh, we've got people trapped. <laughs> In, uh, in a box here. Um, and uh, we are waiting for uh, the march to start. Uh, but before we do that, um, we, like I mentioned, we have Kyle Elliott joining us. He's again, not here with us yet, but I just wanna give you a little bit of background on him for when he jumps back in. So like I said, Kyle, I taught him in 2006, I think. 2005 was the first year that I taught Kyle um, at Woodruff High School. And Kyle Elliott is a lawyer in Toronto, Canada, where he serves as the manager uh, diverse, of diversity, inclusion, and outreach initiatives at Blake Kessels and Graydon LLP. Uh, in this role, Kyle leads the firm's diversity and inclusion outreach initiatives, which are designed to attract students Oh, I just lost my place there. Uh, to attract students from diverse backgrounds to the practice of business law. Kyle's also responsible for collaborating with key stakeholders to promote the firm's internal diversity and inclusion strategies and initiatives. Kyle is also a former president of the Black Law Students Association at Osgood Hall Law School, and he currently serves on the board of directors of the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers. And we are so excited to have him and have had him working with us on this project uh, for the last couple months. So uh, what are we doing here today? So Noah, 
Can you give us a, a little bit of a explanation of what's gonna happen in the next 30 to 45 minutes? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So we will be streaming live as we go through. So those who are not able to get on Minecraft can watch live on YouTube and those on Minecraft can listen to the chat and about the builds. And we'll be going through everything that we've built on here, which is actually kind of a lot, it took a while. And we'll be talking a little bit about each stop. So that's it. That's basically everything. Awesome. And uh, we will be chatting again with, uh, with Kyle. We're gonna be chatting about these monuments that the boys have built in Minecraft. They've spent the last couple of weeks and a uh, couple months really learning about uh, some really amazing people in history and the things that they have done uh, in order to uh, make change in the world. Um, all right, so as we go through the, uh, this, we would really like people to consider donating to the charity of our choice. Um, and Nathaniel, I'm wondering if you could tell us about uh, that that uh, organization. Yeah, sure. Um, so at Black Boys Code, they're inspired young men of color to find their confidence and realize they have the ability on, to take on any challenge. They help black boys encourage culture and become tomorrow's drivers, creators and innovators of technology. They don't just teach kids how to code, they help them develop critical problems, solving leadership, leadership skills to collaborate and supportive environment. They give them tools to shape their own future. They show them how to be leaders you can find the donation link on the YouTube live page. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so this is a really amazing program. I understand it's Canadian wide. Uh, I do believe that it's also uh, something that's in the United States, um, but a really, really amazing program. So if you feel inclined, we would love for you to check them out and uh, donate to uh, the amazing things that they're doing for um, their community. All right. Well, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement, the death of George Floyd and the recent shootings of Jacob Blake, along with the anniversary of the March on Washington and Martin Luther King's famous uh, speech, uh, I Have a Dream, uh, that is, was happened in 1963 uh, on to today's date, we want to bring uh, people together in solidarity to fight against racism and to learn how to be anti-racist. Before we get started, and Nathaniel, if you could be typing these into the chat, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah. So before we get started, we just wanted to go over some guidelines. Uh, we're so excited to have everybody here, but we want to be respectful. We want to make sure that everybody is here for the right reason uh, and supporting um, this this uh, cause to, to become more anti-racist. So got some guidelines, so please stay with the group. Uh, this is like walking through a museum and getting a tour. Uh, we will be walking. Uh, go in. Yeah, so stay with the group, walk together, and stay. we will be discussing each monument and statue. Uh, Maybe boys, this is where you could help me. Is there anything that you can do in Minecraft that they shouldn't be doing? Because I'm not, I don't know too much. Um, anything in Minecraft like f flying or teleporting? Try not to spam the chat. That would be, that'd be quite nice. Okay, please don't spam okay. the chat. Um, we want, we want everybody to be mindful that this is a peaceful spam. protest to show our solidarity in the fight for, against racism and oppression. If you're not acting accordingly, uh, the boys will remove you from the server. So please be forewarned. So maybe put that in the chat too. If people are not complying, then they will be asked if to leave. You are not nice. Yeah. <laughs> what? If, you if are you're not a bad boy or a bad girl, yeah. go. If you are... If you if you are being a bad boy or 
bad going girl you will go <laughs> all right so i think that uh gets us in a in a spot for us to get started so i'm going to who okay. has who has the first uh stop who's wait sh sh shut them all out shut them out well let's who's got the first stop i believe i have the first stop okay so noah's gonna be our tour guide to start ready i'm gonna let them out in three two all right one here we go making our I'm way doing it. i'm doing it all right, so everybody who's watching this, uh, please bear with me. I'm new to Minecraft, <laughs> and so I walk a little bit weird. I seem to go sideways a lot. All right, so we're making our way into our first um, monument, and uh, we've got lots of different people here ready to... Where should we all stand, Noam? Are we in the right spot? Well, anyone can go wherever they want in this one. It's totally all up to you. Okay, so have a look around. You can see everybody walking around, checking it out. Oh, somebody's looking at me. Hello there. This is chaos. All right, so Noah, can you tell us about what we're looking at here? Absolutely. So um, as I'm sure you saw as you passed, as you passed through the arch, this is um, a man called Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi was an amazing man who believed in peaceful protests. He was born in 1869 in India, and he studied law in England and then moved to South Africa for a few years. Once back in India, Gandhi led the fight for Indian independence from the British Empire. He organized several non-violent civil disobedience campaigns. During these campaigns, large groups of the Indian population would do things like refusing to work, sitting in the streets, boycotting the courts, and more. Each of these peaceful protests may seem small by themselves, but when most of the population does them at once, they can have an enormous impact. Gandhi was put in prison several times for organizing these protests. He would often fast, which is not eating, while he was in prison. The British government would eventually have to release him because the Indian people had grown to love him. The British were scared of what would happen if they let him die. One of his main protests was about salt. The Indian people had everything they needed to make salt, but British rulers forced them to pay very high prices for salt. Gandhi didn't believe that this was right, so he set up from a small village of around 70 people and walked 240 miles to the ocean. Along the way, Thousands upon thousands of people joined him and ended with a group of protesters two miles long, and that's not even single file. Once they had reached the ocean, they used their skills to make salt for free. And it took a whole year of marches like this one for the law to be changed and for Indians to be given the right to make their own salt instead of having to pay for it. During that time, lots of people were arrested and imprisoned, including Gandhi. And that's all I have about Gandhi. Wonderful, Noah. Can you explain your build? So this is Gandhi. He's holding salt and he's by the ocean. And we've got his two mile or three block long um, amount of protesters. Mm -hmm. And we can thank them all for joining because, well, they have to. <laughs> and um, that's it. So it took a while to put together, but not too long. So thank you for coming along. And whenever you're ready, let's move on. Wonderful. All right, so let's move on to our next stop. Excuse me, people, I'm coming through. I don't know what I'm doing, so here I come. I teleport you, Rebecca. No, I wanna walk. Look at, I'm walking. Ah. I'm walking into the wall. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, somebody I think was trying to hurt me. Don't hurt. Oh, you, oh you teleported they me. Ah, oh, Josh! What are you done? I I'm, think I just built a big wall. All right, are we, 
Are we at the next one? Am I at the next one? Yeah, I teleported you. Oh, but there's a wall. Oh, I think I'm. I don't know. Oi! 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 It's Freya! Freya! Oh, wait, what is Amber? Uh, Nathaniel, do you mind, so do you mind if you stop shouting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, here we are at our next stop. Awesome. Okay, so Nathaniel, I believe this one is your stop, correct? Yes. Okay, so who do we see here? What are we looking uh, at? This is Violet Desmond. Okay. Um, and I'm about to read a bit uh, about her. Okay. Okay. So Violet Desmond was born on July 6th, 1940 in Halifax, mm -hmm. Canada. She was Canadian, a Canadian businesswoman and a civil rights activist, a civil activist who built a career as a beautician and was a mentor to young black women in uh, in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Is that Nova, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Desmond School of Beauty Culture. It is a story of her courage, uh, courageless, no, not courageless. Courageous? Courageous refusal to accept an act of race, uh, racial discrimination that provided inspiration to a later generation, the black person in Nova Scotia and in the rest of Canada. She was thrown into jail in 1946 because in the movie theatre she wanted to sit downstairs where the white people were allowed to sit. She didn't want to sit upstairs in the balcony where the black people had to sit. The police held her in jail overnight. Brave Desmond paid a fine of $20 the next day. 20 Yeah, $20, even though she had done nothing wrong. Today we think of her being brave, average, Avon cut Afro cut for the rights of a African Canadian and helping inspire the human rights movement in Canada. Wonderful, Nathaniel. So tell us about what you've built here. So uh, if what if we come all the way over here on the entrance, uh -huh. you will see Viola Desmond buying a ticket right that's over here sorry i'm not over there see i can't yeah. walk straight <laughs> over, over, over here over yeah here. yeah over here yeah and then and then if you come in here you will then see her watching the movie and she being arrested by the police and by the police and she'd be taken away Right, and this is her right here. Got it. Yep. And that's everything about it. Wonderful. So super cool build. So we've got Kyle back on here. He's joining us. Uh, Kyle, I gave you a little introduction there at the beginning. Uh, love for you to say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Kyle. I'm a lawyer in Toronto. I work in the space of diversity and inclusion. Uh, I am one of Rebecca's former students from a few years ago. I won't say how many years. But oh, I think I there. think I gave that away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I because I think I called I called you a young man, and then I was like, mm, I don't know if he's that young anymore. <laughs> yeah, That's okay. I, I, I'm bad at math, so I don't know exactly how long ago, but we'll just say it was a little while ago. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we had the pleasure of having um, Kyle come in to our Social Changemaker program uh, to talk to us about uh, diversity, inclusivity, and more specifically about anti-racism. And uh, we invited Kyle back uh, to be a part of our, um, our walk, our anti-racism walk and protest, because uh, he gave us such great information um you know it was fun to see him as the teacher and not the student and he did an amazing job so maybe we can uh as we go through we'll ask kyle uh, a few questions so maybe as we move on to the next one maybe you can give us a definition of what racism is 
And boys, you can yeah. let everybody go through to the next one. Absolutely. So I can go through. Be free to keep those. Okay, so Kyle's going to talk now. <laughs> oh. So I'm just going to maybe quickly give us uh, some helpful definitions. I think when we talk about these issues, uh, you know, sometimes they're really hard to understand. Sometimes they're really hard to appreciate. And, you know, if we start with common definitions, it's easier to have a productive conversation. Um, so I think important to acknowledge is, you know, I think we all know race, we've probably all heard race is a social construct. Um, in that sense, you know, all humans are the same. 99% uh, of our, our DNA is shared. Um, that being said, just because race technically on a biological level doesn't exist, doesn't mean that race isn't powerful and doesn't mean it doesn't shape our experiences and how we live our lives. So when I define racism, I, use, I like to start with a pretty broad definition um, because that allows us to you know, talk about a lot of different forms of racism. So I keep it pretty simple, and I, I usually define racism as pre prejudice and or discrimination against people because of their race. Um, and when I say that, you know, there's probably a few words we are, are well advised to also define. So when we're talking about prejudice, what we're talking about is, you know, ideas. We're talking about judging or having ideas about someone or a group of people uh, before you know them, and that's based on, you know, their group identity their race, their religion, their gender, et cetera. Uh, when I talk about discrimination, now we're moving from ideas to actual actions and treatment. So that's, you know, unfair treatment of a person or a group of people because of their group identity. Again, being, you know, whether it's race, ability, religion, culture, et cetera. And, you know, discrimination is an action that comes from prejudice. You know, part of the inspiration for this march and, you know, a lot of the conversations that are going on around the the world right now are concerned with anti-black racism and so you know i think it's important to define what that is because it's also quite different and pretty unique and so the way i define anti-black racism is prejudice attitudes beliefs stereotyping or discrimination that is directed at black people anti-black racism this is important is rooted in black people's unique history and experience of enslavement and colonization so that's a pretty unique experience in the western world which, you know, is important to keep in mind when we're talking about this issue. So that unique history and experience of enslavement and colonization. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kyle. That's, uh, that's amazing. Um, and it brings me back to when you came and spoke to us. And, uh, and, and it's put a lot of uh, thought and a lot of uh, what we've done here today, um, you know, for these guys to learn more. You know, they were really upset by what was going on in the world but it's taken you know one of the things that you told us to to do was really that education piece and uh and so we've spent time really understanding the historical piece and and the fact that it's happening not just happening you know in the united states which is what we see on tv but that it's happening in canada and that it's happening in the uk and and like you said the western world um our next stop is is not in one of those places, uh, but this gentleman that I believe Noah you're going to talk about, correct, um, yeah. is uh, is definitely somebody that uh, has made a huge difference in the world uh, related to anti -ra black anti racism. So, as I'm also sure you will see as you came through the arch, this is Nelson Mandela. And he was born in 1918 in South Africa. South Africa is home to many different peoples and cultures. So much so that it's been nicknamed the Rainbow Nation. But sadly, at the time that Nelson Mandela was growing up, there was a huge racial divide, divide in the country. Like many of us, Nelson Mandela felt that everyone deserves to be treated the same, regardless of their skin color. And so in 1994, on 1944, he joined the African National Congress, the ANC, which is a political group that strikes for equal rights for blacks and whites. In 1948, the South African government introduced a system called apartheid. Under these new racist laws, black people and white people were forced to lead separate lives. They weren't allowed to live in the same areas, share a table at a restaurant, attend the same schools, or even sit together on a train or bus. 
Nelson Mandela became an important figure in the ANC, but his activism made him very unpopular with the authorities. And in 1956, he was arrested for treason, the crime of betraying your country's government. Held in Johannesburg prison, it would be five years until the charges were dropped and Nelson was released. In 1964, Nelson was arrested again and charged for plotting to overthrow the government and given life sentences. Nelson would spend the next 27 years behind bars. Over time, Nelson Mandela became a famous prisoner and there were calls all around the world to free Nelson Mandela. And finally, in 1989, the president of South Africa, F.R. de Klerk, met with Nelson Mandela in 1990 and set him free. In the 1994 general election, all races in South Africa were allowed to vote, and Nelson's hard work for so many years finally paid off. The ANC won, and Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first black president. Unbelievable. And yesterday we, we were having a conversation, and maybe, you know, for those of us who are a bit older, 1994 really does not seem that far away. For the younger ones, they found it, they thought it was still far away. Um, but it's shocking that it was 1994 that this is when, the, you know, everybody in South Africa had the opportunity to vote. Um, it's insane. Insane, eh, Noah? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. I hope everybody had an opportunity to look around. But can you tell us about your build, Noah? What do we see here? Um, yeah, um, we've just had a few issues with some people. Uh -oh. being, so everybody wanted me to make an example. Stop, stop. Oh, I'm fine. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, maybe I know you could put something in the chat. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe that one's off. Okay, okay. Wonderful. All right, all right. Do you want to tell us about your build now, or should we move on? Okay, okay. okay. So let's... YouTube? You're, 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 no, just then. You're fine now. Though. Okay. Well, hopefully that that's beyond my my pay grade here. Uh, I got the I got the stream going, and I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> and I'm walking through Minecraft right now, so that that's a big thing. All right. Well, thank you so much, Noah. Except um, can hear us. What's that? It's better now. Okay. Better. Wonderful. Um, all right. So as we make our way to the next one, Kyle, maybe I can ask you another question. Um, so what are some ways that racism um, manifest, manifests itself? How do we see this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think actually really important to think about. Because these two examples of racism on TV, on the internet, on the world or social media, and, and those are very you know, easy examples to identify. My point is to say, oh, that was racist. But, you know, often when we talk about racism, we're just talking about racism. 
abstracted, but racism can also be thought about completely only getting the thing that was abstracted. And so we need to think about what was going to do. We also need to think about how racism is done. I know we have a list of organizations and institutions. So there's, you know, I guess I told you that we have a list of there, but in terms of how we think about racism, we can think about it on what we're doing now. So when we know that specific example where again, going back to our talk, there's a lot of those things that we don't generally think about, right? You know, we, we go to school and we don't understand that just by being in that building, we're dealing with racism. Absolutely. That, you know, that there are things that become so normalized that without taking a step back and really thinking about it, they, they can be really hard to you know, identify and to see. And so, you know, these ideas, these racist ideas get turned into policies, they get turned into practices, and then there's a long history of them being in place, and we never even think to look at them as being something that perpetuates racism. Yeah, and I think it's great. Like, I think that right now there's a huge discussion about that, and it's making everybody way more aware of mm -hmm. of this and and hopefully that means that we each one of us like i think one of the things that you pointed out was that we need to um recognize our own biases or or where racism is in our life and how we don't really know that we're even doing it and i know personally like even after having that conversation you know i look back and i look at my life and i and where where i could be doing things differently um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to move on to the 1963 Bristol bus boycott. So I'm excited to hear about that one. Uh, that happened in the UK. So I think that's Noah, that's you as well, right? Yeah, that is me. Okay. Can well. you let us all through? Hey, Rosie, can you let us through? All right, here we go. Look at this, it's so cool. I'm learning so much about Minecraft. <laughs> so much. Uh, all right, so tell us about it, Noah. So in 1963, 18 year old Guy Bailey arrived on time for his job interview. Bailey was well qualified for the post, but he would not be taken on because he was black. He strolled up to the front desk. He told the receptionist why he was there. She looked over him and said, I don't think so. Bailey thought she must be mistaken. The name is Mr. Bailey, he told her. The receptionist stood up and went to the manager's office and Bailey heard her call through his door. Your two o'clock appointment is here and he's black. 
The manager shouted back from inside his room, tell him the vacancies are full. Bailey protested. There was an advert for applicants, applicants in the local paper only the day before. Just an hour ago, his friends had rung the same office and been told there were plenty of jobs. There's no point in having an interview, said the manager, still in his office, refusing to come out and meet Mr. Bailey. We don't employ black people. This was a familiar story in many parts of the world. The newspapers were full of stories about the struggle against segregation in the deep south of the US and the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Can people stop killing everyone? Please? That's not funny. Heard. But this wasn't uh, Alabama or Mississippi. This wasn't Johannesburg or Pretoria. This was Bristol, England in 1963. The manager who refused Bailey a job was acting within his rights. Half a century ago, it was, it was legal in the UK to discriminate against someone because of the colour of their skin. At the state-owned Bristol Omnibus Company, run by the local council, the colour bar was an open secret. Despite the presence of an established Caribbean community in the city, no non-white driver or conductor had ever been employed in the network. The company's management acted with the... Sorry, I don't know this word, sorry. That's okay. Oh. Approval of the local branch of the trade union that represented bus crews. These were, de these were the days um, when workplace unrest was common, but on this issue, both sides of the industrial divide stood together against interrogation. But Bailey's unsuccessful interview was turning point. Members of the local black community, supported by many of their white neighbors, led a boycott of the buses in protest. The campaigners imitated the nonviolent actions of Martin Luther King and the other American advocates of racial tolerance. The Bristol bus boycott was to prove a watershed moment. The campaigners maintained that their efforts led directly to the UK's first ever laws against race-based discrimination. Today, outside Bristol, the story of the bus boycott is barely known. But to those who led it, this was the UK's own version of the civil rights movement that shook the American South. Wonderful. Uh, so it's so interesting to hear about different places uh, in the in the world. I know. Um, I think often, and Kyle, you could probably attest to this that everybody thinks, "Oh, well, it all, it's only happening in the United States," you know, because we see that and we know about uh, you know slavery and segregation and. We seem to think that in Canada this doesn't exist, and and often there's probably people who don't think it existed in the UK. Oh, absolutely, and you know, it's kind of dangerous to think that way that it's only an American problem, and that's why obviously you know when we talk about education, you know, learning the history is really important. You know, slavery slavery was widespread across the British Empire until 1834. That's only, you know, three decades or so before slavery was abolished in the United States. So we're talking about the same time period. Um, you know, there were slaves in the UK. The UK was, you know, a participant in the Atlantic slave trade. There was slavery in Canada. There was slavery, you know, very wide, on a very widespread basis all over the place. And, you know, when we talk about policies like segregation, which, you know, unfortunately followed slavery, that was also something that happened in you know, more than just the U.S., uh, obviously, we talked about Nelson Mandela and apartheid, and that's a very extreme example of segregation. But it's also an example that shows us that it wasn't just the U.S. And that's why, you know, talking about these different events actually is so helpful and so important. Awesome. All right. Well, moving on to our next event, or um, I got to look at what what's up next, boys? You help me out here. Uh, Washington March. Okay. Yes. So it's the anniversary of 
of that today, isn't it? And that's why we specifically chose today to do this. So Josh, this is you. Do you want us, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the March on Washington? Are you there? Oh, did we lose Josh? Oh, he's there. Josh, are you gonna, he won't unmute. <laughs> We lost him. Josh, are you there? Josh, yeah. uh, I, I didn't realize I was muted. I can't have Zoom and Minecraft open. Okay. That's going to kick me out. Okay. Awesome. So can you tell us about... Here, I can... St um, so between 2,000 and 3,000 people went to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, to march for equality on August 28th, 1963. Uh, many guest speakers made speeches, the most famous of whom is Martin Luther King Jr. They were fighting against segregation in the school system, and they wanted equal jobs for all. Martin Luther King had been preaching about equality in black churches for several years already, and the march was organized by the Big Six, who were leaders of the civil rights movement, A. Philip Randolph, Whitney M. Young Jr., Martin Luther King, James Farmer, Roy Wilkins, and John Lewis. Bayard Rustin was the chief organizer of the march. At the end of the day, the Big Six met with President John F. Kennedy in the White House. The march invoked the Emancipation Proclamation and the Declaration of Independence. There has been, become known as the I Have a Dream speech. The famous line wasn't actually part of King's planned remarks that day. After leading into King's speech with the classic spiritual, I've been buked and I've been scorned gospel star, gospel star Mahalia Jackson stood behind the civil rights leader on the podium. At one point during his speech, she called out to him, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream, referring to the film referring to a familiar scene he had referenced in earlier speeches. Departing from his prepared notes, King then launched into the most famous part of his speech that day. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. From there, he built to his dramatic ending at which he announced the tolling of the bells of freedom from one end of the country to another. I quote, and when this happens, we will be able to speed up the day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Awesome, Josh. So yes, I mean, all of us, I think, have heard that those famous words that I have a dream. Um, can you tell me what you've built here? I have built the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Monument. Okay. And there are some protesters around. And in front of the Washington Monument, there is Martin Luther King in the middle in front of the podium and the others of the big six. Cool. And I put you Awesome. And we're going to hear about another one of those gentlemen who I believe we just lost not that long ago uh, from Nathaniel. Yeah, I think it was. yeah. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So let's move on to our next one. What do we have? Uh, what do we have coming up next? Um, so Lewis. Yes. This is the other gentleman <clears throat> that we're going to hear about. So let's move on to hear about John Lewis. Yes, John Lewis, that's me. This is, I gotta get there. Why is it so hard for me to walk straight? I would teleport you, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I'm the worst person to be streaming this. Oh, here we go. Okay, well, I feel like I'm still on a road. 
Hey, you, you so, can oh, watch all of it. Okay, so I just have to walk straight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. John Lewis. Yeah, tell us about John Lewis. John Lewis was born on February 21st, oh, 1940. Uh, he attended an all-black school and was encouraged by his parents not to challenge the racial inequalities of the South. As a teenager, he was inspired by the courageous... No. Courageous? Courageous protector uh, protest of Rosa Parks and the Reverend Martha... A Reverend? Rev Reverend? The... What? Is it the Reverend? Reverend Martha... Uh, Martin Luther King. Yes. Uh, Lewis attended university in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, okay, Tennessee, Tennessee. 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 He became active in civil rights m movement and organized sittings at lunch counters and other segregated public places. He also participated participated in the 1961 Freedom Riders when the whites and blacks rode bus buses together in the south to protest segregation. Seg segregation. Uh, segregated. Seg no, segregation. I can't say the word. Blech. In 1963, Lewis helped organ organize and spoke at the uh, historic what march at Washington, where Martha Martin Luther King delivered his famous "I Have a Dream" speech. Although John Lewis was still on his in his early teens, he was recognized as one of the big six leaders of the civil rights mo movement. In 1965, John Lewis led more than 600 peaceful protesters across a bridge in Selma, uh, Abba. Alabama. Alabama, and this is what you see here. Okay. Uh, Alabama. In the response to local violence, the bridge uh, violence against civil rights activists, the protesters were attacked by the police officers, and more than 50 people, including John Lewis, were hospitalized. The day came known as Bloody Sunday. It's interesting. So that happened in 1963, correct? Yeah. And think about the stuff that we're seeing on TV right now. Has much changed? Uh, yeah. Do you think? No, no, sorry. No, like, the, the, this. Uh... Yeah? Did you yeah. think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I got... You got two people asking you questions. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyways, I think it's important to point out that, you know, Nathaniel here is talking about 1963 when, you know, these civil rights activists went out and were fighting against the police. And we're still seeing that today, you know, that the that they're still fighting and they're still being targeted. And it's uh, very unfair. Right, Nathaniel? Yeah. OK, good. All right, so we're going to move along and we're going to bring it back to Canada. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, different types of black anti-racism. We started off with Gandhi looking at India, uh, but we're going to bring it back to Canada and look at uh, another thing that, you know, again, Canadians often say, you know, we don't have problems here. We're very multicultural. You know, uh, we, we encourage everyone to come to Canada when in reality, our history is is not so clean ourselves. Uh, and it's only been in the, I would say in the last decade uh, that this has really come to the, to the forefront where Canadians are learning about um, our history and, and some of the things that we've done to the people that lived here before us. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Looks like it's raining. Who made it rain? Yep. I made it rain. Oh. No. No, no, I made it rain. You made it thunder. Okay. Can am I going am I going the right direction? Can you tell can you teleport, teleport me? You. 
What's your username again? The Mavenator. The Mavenator? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can we turn it no. All right. So here we are. So Josh, can you tell us uh, about the blue quill sit-in? Yeah. So this is the blue quill residential school sit-in. Yeah. So the term residential school refers to an extensive school system set up by the Canadian government and administered by churches that had the nominal objective of educating Aboriginal children, but also the more damaging and equally ex explicit obje objectives of indoctr indoctrination. Indoct Trinating yeah. them into Euro Canadian and Christian ways of living and assimilating them into mainstream Canadian society. The residential school system operated from the 1880s and into the closing decades of the 20th century. The system forcibly separated children from their families for extended periods of time and forbade them to acknowledge their Aboriginal heritage and culture or to speak their own language. Children were severely punished if these, among other strict rules, were broken. Former students of residential... Schools? Former students of residential schools have spoken of horrendous abuse at the hands of residential schools, physical, sexual, emotional, and psych psychological. Residential schools provided Aboriginal students often to grade five that focused on training students for manual labor and agriculture, light industry, such as wood and domestic work such as long Two primary, primary objectives of the residential school system was to remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, families, traditions, and cultures, and to uh, and to assimilate them into the dormant cult, dominant culture. These objectives were based on the the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some thought, thought and it infamous, infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today, we recognize that the policy of assimilation was wrong and has caused great harm and has no place in care. Blue Quills opened as a residential school in 1931. In 1970, Stanley Redcrow led the average students and teachers at the Blue Quill Residential School in a 17-day-long 17 17 sit-in to protest the English controlling their schools and not allowing them to learn their own culture. Several of the members of the protest got flown to Ottawa they, were, they requested the Prime Minister grant them control of the school, and they got it. The next year opened with a new purpose, aiming to have children progress the white man's education while continuing to retain their dignity and self respect All right. Well, thank you, Josh. Can you tell us about your build here? So I built the, I built the residential school, and... Participating in the sit-in, mm -hmm. and someone has decided. What did they do? They are doing the sit-in. Okay. Awesome. And I, this to me, like I, can't, I saw a picture of the school, and it's like, look, I can't believe how much it looks like it. It's crazy. Good job in there. Um, all right. Well, let's move along. But as we do that, I just have a question. This kind of brought I'm something. Interested. Someone just got struck, I think. Okay, that would probably be a good idea. Um, question for Kyle. So I think, or maybe more of a statement, I think, you know, when you're talking about that historical piece, 
you know, Josh just mentioned here at the end of it, it says um, the students were, you know, considered in, were given inferior education, often only up to grade five that focused on training students for manual labor and agriculture, light industries such as woodworking and domestic work, such as laundry work and sewing. What does that do to, uh, I mean, this could be in, the, in a black community, it could, but in this particular case, what does that do for people today? You know, how does that history play a part in where they are today? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And like, that's why it's so important to keep the history in mind because, you know, even though we've gotten past slavery, we've gotten past segregation, the impacts of these things, the impacts of residential schools, for example, have very real impacts on you know, communities and, and people living today. Because, you know, when we think about those sorts of examples of institutional racism, where there are these policies in place. And we're talking about the ability to get an education, you know, to get a job, to have adequate health care. Uh, these are things that, you know, don't just go away overnight. These are things that, you know, if my parents weren't able to get an education, they weren't able to get a job, that's going to have a very real effect on me. You know, if that was the same for me, then you can easily see how that would affect my children. And so you can see how the generational trauma kind of you know, flows through from parent to child to you know, child again. So, no, it's, it's really important to understand, especially when we talk about, you know, a lot of these things are not, you know, when we're talking about these events, they weren't that long ago, and we know that things are still happening that have these same effects today. Yeah, and uh, I think this is, yeah, really important to point out, and I'm, I'm so glad that we've had the opportunity to look at these historical pieces. So what is uh, what is up next, boys? Next is um, I don't remember what it was called. Um, House statue. It's it's Nathaniel this time. Oh no! It's, I think it's. I'll just open it. I think it's uh, the Edward Colston statue. Is that yeah, me? That yeah, that's good. that's me. Yeah, that's me. All right, so can somebody put me there? I'll teleport you to me in a second. Uh, uh, no, I missed it. I'm generous. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay, I will. Uh, I will. Okay. Yeah, let me just... Here, just walk. Keep walking. Me? That's the school. Okay. Yes. Oh. I'm going oh, the wrong sorry. way, aren't I? Sorry, people. We trapped you. I'm going the wrong way. There you go. I'll put you. You're there. Am I there? Yeah. Okay, no, there we are. I'm going to come for you now. Can Our, I burn all the bunnies? <laughs> Cannot burn those so bunnies. we've moved into more present day. So tell us about what we're looking at or what's going on here, Nathaniel. Okay, uh, so here is the uh, statue up here and these people putting down the statue and then over here, if you... Rebecca, I, I just oh sorry, you. what? Where, you, where am I going? I, I, I teleport you. I teleport you. Okay. Hello. And if you then come over here, here if you see here, Rebecca, yeah. this is the statue being dumped in by these people behind you. Okay. By these people, got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and now I'm going to read uh, about the statue. Okay. There was a Black Lives Matter protest in the city, the center, in the centre of Bristol on, in, in England on June 7th uh, this year. During the march, which was peaceful, some protesters pulled down the statue of Edward Colston. Edward Colston was a slave trader who worked in Bristol. He was born in 1636 and died in 1721. He worked for the Royal Afri African Company that held monopoly of the African slave trade in England. The company of this, the slaves, including women and children, uh, yeah, the, com the company branded the slaves, including the women, the children, with its RAC initials on their chests. It was believed that the company may have sold sold more, sold about 100,000 West African people into slavery. 
between 1672 and 1689. It was through this company that Colston made the bulk of his fortune using profits, uh, using pro using his, using profits to move into money lending. Colston then began to develop a reputation as the philanthropist who donated to charitable causes such as schools and hospitals in Bristol and London. In fact, they were much of this fortune was made in the slave trade that was largely ignored until 1990s. The statue was 5.5 metres high and made of bronze during the protest that was pulled down in front of the river at Bristol Harborside in Bristol. Yeah, that's pretty crazy to think that, you, that he was being honoured for his philanthropic work. Yeah. Uh, and he had made his money in the slave trade. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, obviously that is sort of a test of what's happening today, and people are not standing for it anymore. Um, and hopefully a way to not, obviously, you can't change history, but you can uh, change the way that people look at history um, and learn from different perspectives, which I think is very, very important. Um, I just read an article of a girl who, who became a chemist and she just remembers looking back at thinking, how come there are no black people who are chemists, you know, and, and the reality was is that either they didn't have the opportunity or they didn't uh, put them in the books, which is completely unfair. Um, all right, well, we're going to move on to our last space. Um, how do I get there? Oh my god. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. I like that I can walk through people. I know the water. So, so before we make our way in there, or maybe once we get in there, maybe just some, uh, we can get some final thoughts uh, for my file here. Um, what I wanted to ask. Uh, so there's a couple things I think we can maybe put them together. So what does it mean to be an anti-racist? Uh, and maybe specifically black uh, anti-racist? Uh, but what are the ways to practice and, uh, and be able to actually do something? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. I think, I think, I think like, in racism is a good term. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I think that's uh, such a good way for young people to hear that, you know, every little thing um, can make a difference and that, you know, doing something even as uh, something like this in Minecraft where they're they're learning, they're, they're educating themselves. Hopefully pe people following here are also being educated um, and, and just being able to uh, have that understanding, like you said, at an at interpersonal level. Um, I'm going to guess, and maybe boys, you could tell me, have you guys been having conversations around the dinner table now uh, about race? Have Has any of that come up in your houses? I mean, well, my sister's black, so it already happens whenever racism happens. Right, so you guys are having these conversations. Obviously. So Nathaniel and Noah, did you, by doing this, you know, were you having more conversations at home about racism? Uh, a bit, yeah. We've been, yeah, I, th I think so, yeah. I think we have been having more conversations. Yeah. Well, I agree, but just a little bit. Yeah, so just having some more conversations. Good. Yeah. Awesome. So we were ending at, uh, in this next area where I seem to be in a sea of people. Um, what do we have here, boys? What, a, what was the last thing that was built? I'm walking through lots of people. Uh, this last thing we built was George Floyd. Okay. Nathaniel, can you please stop clearing my inventory? Yeah, but I'm doing it because everyone keeps on stealing things from the armor stands. If everyone stopped keeping stealing things from the armor stands, then I would stop clearing people's inventories. I have no idea <laughs> what you guys are talking about. Just don't I've been think. clearing. I've been clearing everyone's, not just yours. Okay, so let's let's go back to our build here. So what what do we have built here? Noah. Uh, so or Nathaniel? Okay. No, 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 okay. Oh, I think you're on mute, Noah. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll go. Okay. So, right, uh, you go. You have a street. This is a modern street because this happened in 2020. These are the George Floyd protests. And as you can see, we've got houses on all the sides. Will you please stop? Nathaniel, Nathaniel, will you please? Nathaniel, stop. Okay, I think Nathaniel might have to get kicked out. Okay, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, we're almost done here, so tell us. So this seems like, did you guys all build this one? Yeah. Okay. We so, all built most of them. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, so we're, we've got the George, George Floyd uh, protests that have been happening. And, and crazy enough, while we were building this, you know, we thought George Floyd was going to be the end of it. And just recently, we had the shooting of uh, the gentleman in Wisconsin, um, you know, and it's it's crazy to think that, you know, you were busy building this one uh, to talk about George Floyd. And then you have uh, Jacob Blake, who was shot seven times in, in the back. Um, so, yeah, exactly. so we, I mean, we could continue to build, which is what you know, what we don't want to be doing. We want to continue to build uh, different things where pe it is more peaceful and where, you know, we can be in a world where like Martin Luther King Jr. said that we can live in a place where we are all getting along and we are all, it's fair and it's equal uh, for everybody. Um, so uh, to end us off, uh, I think we have a few thank yous. Um, so who do we want to thank, uh, for, for everything that has happened today? We have quite a few people to thank. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you to Kyle Elliott for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and giving us the guidance throughout this project. It is my absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you, James. Delaney from Block by Block for helping us come up with this idea. And I also want to say thank you to Janie Laney, the Minecraft YouTuber, for meeting with us and helping us to guide us in the right direction for this project. And we also want to say thank you to Apex Hosting who gave us this server. Yeah, Apex server. And then Josh, there's one more down there for you. <laughs> there is? Yeah. Do you see that? Mm, I don't know. All right. Well, we're going to thank Kai and Rory who uh, joined us from our previous uh, Social Change Makers program. I think they jumped in to help you guys build a bit, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. They yeah. And Noah, we have another one. Uh, thank you to all of our parents for allowing us to play Minecraft 24-7 for the last month. So, <laughs> thanks. Let's give a big clap. Yes, for the moms and dads. And Nathaniel, last? Uh, yeah, a huge thanks for Rebecca, who's been really encouraging oh. and supporting, uh, for everyone who participated today. Oh, thank you, Nathaniel. I didn't... Please, I didn't... Well, please do your part of making this one a safer place and welcoming, welcoming every place for everyone. <laughs> yes. Can I do it? What's that? Can I flick it? Flick, Good job. flick what? I don't know what you're talking about. Bro, you failed it. Uh, you didn't do it twice. Yes, yeah, so you. thank you. Thank you to everybody who was involved. Uh, this was our first stream. Well, we had a stream before, but this Wait, is our I'm first uh, at, at whatever it is that we just did <laughs> in Minecraft. Uh, please consider, I put in the chat in YouTube, uh, donating to Black Boys Code. Uh, an amazing organization. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak to one of their program directors the other day, and uh, and he told us all about the amazing things that uh, he does for uh, black boys around Canada, and I think also in the United States. Um, uh, but you can, if you can't find the link, it's blackboyscode.ca, and uh, and you can donate there. So thank you everybody for watching, and uh, I guess this is a wrap. Are we not going to let the fireworks finish? Oh, I don't know. Is there fireworks? I should probably be looking at those, eh? Oh, that's yeah, cool. Oh, look at that. How do I get... I want to get closer. Okay, I'm going to stop the fireworks now. Okay. Goodbye. Oh, so 